Russia's war on Ukraine isn't just being fought by the armies of the two countries. Tens of thousands of foreigners are joining both sides. Will they face consequences under international law? And how will they affect the conflict? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. Russia and Ukraine have mobilized hundreds of thousands of soldiers to fight the war. And both countries have made calls for foreigners to join their side. Volunteers are already making their way to the front lines. An Al Jazeera correspondent met these men from Sweden and Switzerland on the train from Poland to Ukraine. One said he faces three years in jail when he returns home, but insisted the sacrifice is worth it. Ukraine says up to 20,000 volunteers from 52 countries have signed up to join an international legion. If this person fits requirement, we uh, give the person uh, contact in Ukraine, and person goes uh, to Ukraine and then signs a contract with armed forces of Ukraine. So this is not mercenaries who are coming to earn money, no, not at all. This is a good people of goodwill who are coming to assist Ukraine to fight for freedom. On the Russian side, President Vladimir Putin has approved allowing foreign fighters. The defense minister says 16,000 volunteers from the Middle East are ready to join. The U.S. believes Moscow is recruiting in Syria, where Russia has been helping government forces since 2015. But the Kremlin says those from the West who fight on Ukraine's side will be considered mercenaries with no protection under the Geneva Convention. As to recruiting mercenaries all over the world and sending them to Ukraine, we can see that they, the Western sponsors of Ukraine, they're not hiding it, they're doing it openly, neglecting every norm of international law. Therefore, if you see that there are people willing to go there and help the people of Donbass as volunteers, especially free of charge, well, we should grant their wish and help them reach the combat zone. Who came up with the idea of throwing mercenaries against our people, thugs from Syria, from the country that was destroyed in the same way as the invaders are destroying us now? All right, let's take a look at the role of foreign fighters in conflicts. The war in Syria had one of the largest mobilization of foreigners. Thousands of them came from Western Europe to fight. After the rise of ISIL in 2014, the UN Security Council adopted resolutions to prevent the recruitment and travel of foreign fighters. Volunteers for Ukraine have been signing up at a faster rate than even in 2014 in Syria and Iraq. Some countries, like Belgium, have tried to discourage their citizens from going, while others, like Latvia, have approved a bill for people to take up arms for Ukraine. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests in Moscow. Pavel Felgenhauer, defense and military analyst. In Providence, Rhode Island, in the U.S., Anthony Dworkin, senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, and in Doha, Omar Ashour, founding chair of the Doha Institute's Critical Security Studies Program. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us today on Inside Story. Omar, let me start with you today. All these foreign fighters that are joining the conflict in Ukraine on both sides, what kind of an impact is that going to have? Well, uh, historically, we know that it has a, uh, uh, an impact, uh, some benefits, and, uh, and maybe a lot of costs. So on the benefit side, uh, they, depending on the, the type, they have a military impact. Uh, from uh, a word from the Spanish Civil War, when you have the International uh, uh, Brigade, uh, was uh, quantity means quality. Um, because of their numbers, the sheer numbers, even though poor training and uh, less expertise, uh, they managed to stop the Franco's army from taking Madrid. And uh, Madrid didn't really fall except, the, the, except after the collapse of the war, uh, after the collapse of the Republic and uh, the end of the war. Um, so there is some military benefits. They increase the manpower of uh, whichever side they, they go to. They help with logistics and supplies. Some may bring military expertise, depending if they were regulars or irregulars. So if they fought before in an 
let's say, an insurgency or, their, or an irregular warfare situation, or if they have formal military training, meaning that they were part of an official uh, armed institute. Um, and uh, also they uh, help with the morale boost, uh, unit cohesion, if especially the ideologues, the hardcores. Um, they, uh, they help a lot with the unit cohesion, we know that. And um, sometimes also they uh, give international uh, legitimacy, good with further recruitment of other foreign volunteers. Uh, um, and uh, it depends on, on uh, the, the, the narrative that, the, 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 uh, the, the, that is uh, upheld. Uh, they help with uh, further, uh, uh, let's say, internationalization of the mm -hmm. cause, giving further legitimacy of the cause. That's on one side. But the costs, of course, we know that any mobilization mm -hmm. and any demobilization uh, has uh, a lot of costs. Uh, also, the uh, always the opposing side uses or abuses. Uh, so let's say if there are volunteers, actual volunteers, who are committed to the cause of defending Ukraine, let's say, the other side, uh, Russia in this case, will be saying mm -hmm. that these are not volunteers, these are mercenaries. Uh, and if they are coming there to, to defend the democracy, they will be accused of being extremists and so on. And the other way around, of course, uh, the other side has... Uh, also, I'm not saying that there are no ideologues, there are no people with like some, mm -hmm. uh, uh, let's say, extremist ideologies uh, in involved, but, uh, but uh, uh, they are very, very different. Uh, types of uh, reasons mm -hmm. uh, people volunteer. Uh, there are also mercenaries, meaning that they're actually paid uh, to fight. Uh, so th those also exist. Uh, but somehow, volunteer and mercenary, right. they get brushed sometimes with the same brush. Um, uh, Omar, let, let, me, let, me, also, let, let, me, let me get yeah. back to you on, on that point about mercenaries in just a couple of minutes. Uh, Pavel, let me go to you. How important is it for President Putin uh, at this particular time, whether symbolically or logistically, how important is it for him to have foreign fighters involved? Well, first of all, we should understand that there are no foreign fighters there, in fact, on the front line, none on the Russian side and a very, very small number on the Ukrainian side. So we're talking about um, a future kind of situation more than uh, one that's already there. Uh, President uh, Putin, uh, 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 the, far, the Russian defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, publicly told the president that there are lots of volunteers in Syria with uh, combat experience, apparently, who can want to want to join the fight in the Donbass, and the president okayed that, but they don't understand, understand they didn't come there yet. It's important for Russia, of course. It's important symbolically that the Russian cause uh, is good a cause and it's going to be joined by foreigners. And secondary, the Russians actually have a very serious manpower issue with their military effort in Ukraine. The regular Russian army is more or less all in. Not all, of course, it has, but it can't move all its troops. I mean, not from the Kuril Islands, not from Kaliningrad and so on. Uh, there are places where you have to keep garrisons anyways. And they don't have much trained reserves. So uh, combat veterans from Syria uh, who had actually fought with the Russians and know the Russians, they've been kind of in Dar al Zor and in Aleppo and Ghouta together. So if they kind of join the fight, well, that would help at least partially in the uh, problem with reserves uh, that right now the Russian military has. Anthony, uh, I saw you nodding um, to some of what Pavel was saying there, so I'm going to let you jump in. But I also wanted to ask you, what are some of the legal ramifications when it comes to foreign fighters volunteering for a conflict such as this one? There's a big difference between foreign fighters who are kind of incorporated into the armed forces of one of the parties to the conflict, whether it's Ukraine or Russia. That is a perfectly established um, procedure with um, historical precedents, um, as Omar mentioned, the Spanish Civil War obviously being uh, a primary one. Um, and under the, the rules of war, it's perfectly accepted that you can bring people in. Um, but the question is, are they part of a regular armed forces or are they sort of um, freelancers who are kind of appearing on the battlefield 
uh, really of their own volition without formally being incorporated into the armed forces. And that makes a certain difference because if they are part of the armed forces, then they enjoy what's known as the uh, privilege of the combatant. In other words, if they're captured, um, they haven't committed any crime, they have to be treated as prisoners of war. Um, this is all assuming that they fight in a lawful way, but their presence on the battlefield is accepted. If they are just kind of freelancers or war tourists who are turning up with a gun, um, then they're in a different position because they're still counted as civilians, but they're civilians who are fighting. And so potentially they could be um, prosecuted under the law of the opposing country for acts of violence. Anthony, if um, I could just, sorry to interrupt, the, the if difference. I could just also ask you though, are, do, you, do you believe that there's gonna be enough concern about what types of fighters are out there by governments that they would initiate releasing guidelines for their citizens to follow in the event that they want to volunteer in Ukraine? It's been, if looking at the, how Western governments have dealt with this issue has been interesting. And there've been some quite and responses. So obviously the governments in Europe, the United States are, um, very committed to supplying assistance to Ukraine, um, short, stopping short of joining the conflict themselves. Um, and some of them, the British Foreign Secretary in particular, Liz Truss, went so far as to suggest that it would be a good thing for British citizens to go and fight. Um, but the British Defense Secretary really kind of wrote back on that comment. And um, I think he has the better case because encouraging your citizens uh, who may or may not have any uh, military training um, to simply go abroad into a obviously very dangerous zone. Um, there are a lot of risks to that. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the government can't protect them. Um, the motivations why people may be there could be quite mixed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are concerns, obviously, about some of them um, when they come back. So it's a it's a complicated and delicate question, I think. Um, you know, people who have extensive military experience, who've served in armed forces, mm -hmm. um, perhaps they would be able to make that adjustment. There's also a question about how these people would fight when they're there. Do they have the kind of discipline and training to fight in accordance with the laws of war? So there are a lot of concerns involved. Uh, Omar, you were talking before about the different types of fighters, and you were talking specifically about mercenaries. And I'm curious to get your opinion about if governments are concerned about what may happen to some of these fighters uh, once they actually return to their home countries? There is uh, usually that concern, uh, but actually the mercenaries, when it comes to that concern, it's uh, they're not the major concern because they're paid to fight. If you don't pay them, they won't fight, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so, But others, um, there may be some concerns with... Uh, you know, the volunteers, for example, that want to, uh, who Syria, in Syria and got particular type of training that could be used in uh, urban terror, um, uh, building of IEDs, uh, uh, sniping in urban areas and so on and so forth. And they, uh, uh, because of the ideology, because of the worldview, um, the perception was that they may cause a threat when they demobilize and return back to their home countries especially if they are affiliated with uh, organizations such as ISIS and, and, and others. Uh, in the case of Ukraine, clearly it's uh, a bit different. Um, uh, so the, the main, uh, I, I guess the main concern that the security services would not, Western security services would not come out and say this publicly because they, they need to be ideologically, cor uh, politically correct and so on. But there's a concern with the ideology on one end, and there's a concern uh, with the type of training that they these volunteers will get. Uh, and of course, there's a concern for why did they go to the war and which organization they are affiliated with when they go to the, the, the conflict area. Uh, some of this the, do not really exist in, in Ukraine, in the Ukrainian conflict. And in, initially, it did not uh, exist uh, in the Libyan conflict. Uh, you remember, there were s several volunteers who went also to Libya. Uh, to fight against Gaddafi regime back in the Libyan uh, Revolution in 2011, and there was uh, there was limited, there was let's say less concern than 
when the case uh, uh, escalated in Syria in 2013 and 2014 and the rise of ISIS and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so th these are some differences. But also, I, I wanted to say that the, the foreign involvement, I may, may I agree with everything that was said, but I may differ a bit on the involvement of, of foreigners, because from the very beginning, from 2014, uh, there were foreign fighters for very different reasons on both sides uh, in, in the Ukrainian case. And, uh, well, you know, the, the Bianca battalions, uh, mainly from Moldovans, uh, from uh, Transnistria, uh, some of the uh, the Serbian Hussar regiment for uh, Serbian volunteers, mm -hmm. that's, that's fighting on the side of Russia. And some uh, remnants of uh, some battalions that fought for the Russians in Chechnya, a Vostok battalion is... is uh, or one of them, uh, although they they somehow were incorporated loosely within the um, within the uh, Luhansk and Donetsk and the, the backers back in 2014, but they showed up in Crimea. They were very clean in 2014. They were in Crimea, and uh, were with videos and pictures. So so they they were uh, there. These are uh, uh, ethnically Chechens. Uh, Omar, I'm I'm sorry. And, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. On the other side as well, the thing. Omar, I'm sorry to interrupt no, you. We we are so, starting to run out of time. Pa Pavel, let me let me ask you this. Um, when Russian President Putin and when the Russian defense minister make the announcement that there are foreign fighters who would volunteer to go to Donbass, is this a decision that was made um, in order to counter what Ukraine is doing when it comes to setting up an international legion? Or was this done because there is worry that um, Russians would be unhappy if more Russian forces would be called up to go into Ukraine? Well, as yes, I say, the Russian uh, uh, political military leadership have a problem with reserves. If this war begins to drag on and uh, develop into a kind of war of attrition, there will be serious problems with uh, uh, replacing manpower and in general. The uh, attrition is not really what Russia is that much ready for. And announcing uh, mobilization in actually in the Donbass, in these uh, so, uh, self-proclaimed republics, which are now recognized by Russia, there is a total mobilization of the male population. Uh, but in Russia, there is not. Uh, Putin went public saying there will be no reservists and no conscripts on the front line, only volunteers, uh, because he knows that politically that would be not very well, uh, badly received by the Russian public, as long as it's an all-volunteer force or uh, semi-all-volunteer fighting there, that's more politically acceptable. Uh, so they would need, of course, volunteers, and Russians actually are not flocking to volunteer to go to fight to Chechnya very much, I mean, to uh, the Ukraine very much, and that's a bit of a problem. On the other side, the Ukrainians don't seem to have a manpower issue. And I don't know whether they form a foreign legion or not, but they have a problem with specialists and the commanders. As they're expanding their military very much right now, there's lots of volunteers, there are lots of reservists, some of them with military expertise, I mean, with some experience fighting in the Donbass, but with different weapons. Now there's Western weapons, they need specialists. And Western weapons, maybe even Western uh, colonels, majors, generals, that would be advisors or actually commanders of newly formed units as the Ukrainian war effort expands. So these are different things. Russians don't want to, to have uh, you know, Syrian generals fighting, uh, commanding their troops in the Donbass, but they need manpower. The Ukrainians need not manpower, but they need expertise and commanders, maybe. Pavel, you also mentioned earlier that, uh, from your perspective, these fighters wouldn't be ready anytime soon. When do you think that they might be ready? Well, I mean, it's, there's a logistical problem to bring them from Syria, uh, especially with the Russian airplanes right now being arrested and not allowed to move, fly out of Russia. Again, you have to kind of, well, uh, filter out who's in Syria, who, who these people are. Of course, the Russians are already there in Syria. They have their connections there. Maybe that will be a bit easier to bring those who want to really know how to fight and not those who uh, just simply want to find a way to get a, a Russian or actually a Donetsk passport and then try to infiltrate Europe. And they're not really interested in really fighting uh, the Ukrainian armed forces. So that will take time to form kind of any kind of large numbers. 
On the Ukrainian side also, the numbers are not very high right now, but apparently there's a lot of people ready to volunteer. But again, they're going to have a problem to discriminate who's there as a tourist and who's really uh, ready to fight and actually knows how to do it and will add uh, to the Ukrainian effort and not detract from it. Anthony, from your perspective, um, whenever it is that more foreign fighters or volunteers are actually on the ground in parts of Ukraine. Do you believe that these fighters could face severe consequences under international law? It, it depends what happens to them, and it depends how they fight. I mean, clearly, if these foreign fighters are captured by Russian forces, um, there are, I guess, two questions. Number one is the question of what should happen to them. Um, and they could be prosecuted uh, if they're not part of a formal military brigade. So, um, but as I understand it, there is at least an effort to incorporate them into a brigade, in which case they should receive treatment as prisoners of war. Um, then, of course, there is sometimes a kind of special opprobrium that can attach to people who are seen to be, um, you know, from outside, maybe. Um, illegitimate, they don't belong there, um, they're particularly resented, you know, so I think they are potentially um, putting themselves at some risk. But it's not, they're not actually committing a crime by going. And if they fight in a lawful way, then, you know, there is no problem um, under the law. Now, of course, there is a question about whether the countries that they come from might want to prosecute them when they come back. Um, and there, in the case of the UK, for instance, there is a kind of archaic law um, in the British statute book that says fighting against a country that Britain is not formally at war with is a crime. But that um, is kind of uh, you know, not observed, and th that was never used to prosecute people in the Spanish Civil War, and I don't think it would be in this case. So really, um, the people who are prosecuted are the people who fight for organizations that their countries deem as terrorists. And uh, I mean, as, as we know, there are some extremist elements uh, on the Ukrainian side. But um, I think the prevalent view would be that most people fighting in Ukraine now are not fighting for a cause that Western governments would deem as terrorist. And therefore, I think we would see a different approach. Anthony, for the fighters who are coming from NATO countries, how much does that complicate the situation on the ground? And also, let me ask you, um, for countries who have fighters on the ground in Ukraine, if those fighters were to get kidnapped or killed or injured, is there a fear in those countries that there would be domestic pressure for those countries to then somehow intervene in the war? Right. I think the essential point here is that Western countries are trying to do essentially everything that they can up to the threshold of directly joining the armed conflict on the side of Ukraine. So, um, and you can see that they're trying quite carefully just to stop short of that threshold. So, for instance, the debate that took place about sending um, warplanes uh, from NATO warplanes, either from Poland or via the US, um, I think illustrated that because there, there was the sense that if mm -hmm. um, Ukrainian pilots were allowed to fly planes from Western countries into the battle space, that that would count as, uh, you know, the essentially they would be launching attacks from mm -hmm. um, Poland or Germany or wherever. And I think you would see the same thing with respect to the volunteers. You know, there would be an absolute prohibition on any serving members of military forces mm -hmm. in Western countries going in any kind of official capacity or even, um, I think there would be a lot of concern even if they were going in an unofficial mm -hmm. capacity um, to, you know, in a context where it could be perceived as um, right. NATO forces fighting on behalf of Ukraine. But people who have military experience, who've left the forces, um, that I think would be seen in a different way. And I think it would essentially be understood that they were going at their own risk. Right. Um, I don't think that even if they were killed, that that would significantly change the debate in Western countries mm -hmm. about participation. 
All right, well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thank you so much to all of our guests, Pablo Felgenhauer, Anthony Dworkin, and Omar Ashour. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.